Hello, folks. This is Rob Baines here, General Manager of Chips Alliance. It's a pleasure to have everyone here today and uh, really looking forward to uh, the talk today by Young Jun Lee. Uh, Young Jun is a physical design engineer at Google Cloud. And before joining Google, he received his PhD uh, from Georgia Tech and worked in Intel Labs for six years. At Google, Young Jun has been working on machine learning chip projects and machine learning based physical design projects for two years. Young Jun has experience in CAD EDA algorithms, physical design, and machine learning, and aspires to use machine learning to help accelerate chip design, which I think is a real benefit as that is a definitive challenge area that uh, we're all interested in seeing uh, novel improvements in. So Young Jun is uh, very open to receiving interactive questions during the talk. So uh, if you have a question, feel free to go ahead and pose it. Uh, and we will try to answer it as we progress along. So with that, let me uh, introduce Young Jun and uh, thank you. Thanks Rob for the introduction. Um, can you hear me? Uh, yes, we're just fine and the, your slides are presented well. All right, uh, let's get started. Let's get, let's get started. Um, yeah, I'm Young Jun. I'm happy to share with you our ex exciting project, uh, learning to play the game of macro placement with deep reinforcement learning. Uh, this work has been a great collaboration within Google, uh, including these people. Here's the outline. First, I'll introduce the project motivation and background, and then I'll describe our approach in detail, followed by our results and comparison with existing works. Then I'll conclude the presentation. This project started as a very ambitious, pro ambitious project by a Google Brain Machine Learning for Systems team. We observed that in the past decade, the success of machine learning was because of the great systems with very powerful custom hardware that enabled running ML algorithms at scale on large scale data. The idea is to return the favor and to develop and use ML method that can transform the way systems and hardware are designed. If you look at the chart on the right from OpenAI, you can see that since 1959 till 2012, the amount of computational power used in the largest AI runs doubled every two years. Whereas since 2012, when the deep learning started taking off, the computational power doubled every 3.4 months. And in comparison, Moore's law had an uh, about uh, 18 months doubling period. So this shows that uh, how important is it, it is for us to develop more powerful chips and systems to keep up with the computational demands of ML algorithms. Why are we seeing rapid increasing compute demand in ML domain? It's because we are trying to solve more difficult problems. Here we have a comparison of the number of states which correlates to computational complexity. For the, for the game of Go, the number of states is uh, 10 to the power of 360, which is really large number. So AI algorithms couldn't beat the hum top human expert until several years ago. In contrast, the simplified version of the chip macro placement, the number of states is much higher. This shows that our problem is really, really complex. A lot of problems in systems and chip designs are combinatorial optimization problems on graphs. For example, we have uh, three examples here, um, compiler optimization, chip placement, and data center resource allocation. All these three have inputs on the form of graphs, such as XLA graph, or chip netlist graph, or um, job workload graph. And the optimization goal is to schedule ops or allocate some resource to the nodes of, of the graph. So combinatorial optimization over graphs is a key problem that appears over and over in systems and chips problems and is interesting to us. For these problems, we are tackling a learning-based ap approach over traditional approaches, such as branch and bound, hill climbing, and ILP solvers. 
solvers. The reasons we, we think our learning-based approach can be superior to the existing method are as follows. First, a learning-based approach can learn the underlying relationship between the context and target optimization metrics and use that to trade off and optimize objective in a way that might be less clear to human expert who designed the optimization and rule-based trade-off methods. Second, which is really exciting, is the learning-based methods can gain experience as they solve more instances of problem and become experts. This is a property that traditional methods do not have. Third, we, know, we now know very clearly how to use distributed system to run them at scale. And we also know very well how to train models with billions of parameters. So there's a lot of potential here for learning-based approaches to be used on complex combinatorial problems. Now, let me give an overview of our problem. The chip placement problem in a simplified form is an example of graph resource optimization. The logic design is synthesized into a netlist, which is a graph of a chip component. Macros, which can be SRAMs or other IP blocks, and the standard cells, which are logic gates as NANDs and NORs, are connected by wires. So this is a graph. And the objective is to place the components of this graph onto the chip flow plan canvas, canvas so that we minimize various costs, such as latency of computation or power consumption or area, while meeting the constraints, such as timing, congestion, density, and so on. There has been de decades of researches on chip design problem. Prior approaches can be categorized into three methods. Partitioning methods, partitioning-based methods such as mean cut, stochastic methods such as simulated annealing, and analytic solvers like the current or previous academic state-of-the-art replays, which will be compared against in this presentation. In this work, we are proposing a new category, which is a learning-based method. Here's a little more detail of our proposed approach. We take a deep reinforcement learning approach to the chip placement problem, where we train an agent or a policy to place the nodes of the chip at least onto chip flow plan canvas one by one. And when all the nodes have been placed, we get a reward signal which we use to update the parameters of our policy so that the policy gets better and better at this task. The state here is the potential placement so far. So our policy and value net can see the embedding of the current node of the graph, netlist graph and place the next. And also the information of the chip canvas which parts of the canvas are already occupied by other nodes. The action at, which, at, action at each time step is where to place the current node to the canvas, which we discretize into grid cells. And our reward function is during the intermediate stage, we just pass zero reward. But at the end, when all the nodes are placed, we calculate the weighted sum of wire length, density, and congestion. Note that this approach provides very sparse reward. Yes, thanks to our rapid prototyping physical design framework, we greatly accelerated the process of gathering rewards. So we are able to get enough samples and still learn from this sparse reward. Here we describe in detail what we are optimizing for. Our ob objective function is to minimize the cost or maximize the expected reward given a placement P of a netlist graph G over the average expected reward of all the graphs in our training set G. 
And the reward function is a weighted sum of wavelengths, condition, and density. Hey, Young Jun. Yes. Yeah, I'm just curious. You know, you mentioned, uh, and you know, again, I want to encourage the audience to feel free to ask questions. But uh, you mentioned about the rapid prototyping environment that uh, you have at Google. I'm just curious uh, what that exactly, what that looks like. Oh, okay, so that, that's a good question. So um, uh, when we started uh, this project, we didn't have the prototyping framework. So uh, we thought about um, creating the Python code around the uh, existing CAD tools. But the problem was the CAD tools are too heavy and slow. So, uh, and the key point of um, deep learning is to gather a lot of sample data. So it's too slow to gather data and um, provide feedback or, you know, reward, right? So that's why we started creating our own lightweight um, place and route engine. So uh, where we have, you know, where, where we capture the, the flow pan canvas and, uh, you know, the placement. And then we also do some very simplistic routing and it, it's really fast. It's uh, written in C++ and then it's optimized. So um, we can iterate through a lot of um, samples really fast. Does your environment also have uh, cost-based uh, engines? In other words, by that I mean, well, cost calculation engines. In other words, say like a uh, static timer or some type of power estimation application, or do you rely upon commercial solutions for that? Yeah, so currently we don't have the time. Actually, we tried a timer, but it was not working so well. Mm -hmm. um, so in, internally, we have uh, wire length, congestion, density, and the timer is what we are working on. Uh, we are working on uh, you know, simplistic or you know, uh, um, modeled uh, timer. And uh, we are going to expand it to uh, power consideration as well uh, in the okay. uh, yeah, later. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Let me continue. Yeah, so uh, a creative idea was um, we took a hybrid, hybrid approach in this work. Uh, what I mean is, uh, so we trained the R RL agent and placed macros one by one. And when all the macros are placed, we fix the location of macros and use a traditional, you know, force directed method or, you know, some other um, state of the art uh, standard cell placer to place the standard cells. So we are not placing standard cells with RL. We are only placing macros with RL. Um, the force-directed method that we tried first, um, it was using you know, uh, an analogy to spring and mass system. So it's well-known um, you know, approach to place the standard cells. It is known to produce reasonably good state standard cell placement fast. Um, and um, yeah, so if we, I mean, in the beginning, we first tried uh, placing the standard cells and macros together, but it was really slow, even after we do some clustering of standard cell to uh, reduce the number of cells or, you know, number of objects to place. So, uh, and because standard cell placement is well-known problem and it's, um, you know, uh, kind of, uh, solved um, by the existing method pretty well. So uh, we, we decided to take this uh, hy hybrid approach and they, that saved a lot of time for us. Uh, we, can, we could uh, uh, go much faster and then gather more um, data samples. So I have two, there's two questions from uh, Sonar Yadiz. And the first one is, is the ordering of nodes arbitrary? Yes, uh, so ordering of uh, macros uh, was uh, what we um, explored in the beginning. And we tried random ordering and then, um, you know, larger first and then, you know, smaller later kind of ordering. And um, we tried other things like, you know, grouping of macros that are related to each other and then do, you know, place them first and then, you know, um, and so on. So we tried a few heuristics. Um, but then uh, we found that in general, um, the well-known method of uh, placing larger macro first and then, you know, smaller later 
uh, works better um, overall. I mean, it's not always, but um, in, uh, we stick to that uh, approach. Um, there could be some um, optimization chances that we may have uh, explored yet. Um, uh, we, we also thought about you know, applying RL for choosing which macro to place next, but uh, it didn't work out so well. So um, yeah, but uh, I admit that there is a, a chance of uh, you know, uh, optimizing further. And then one other question from Sonar is, have you explored immediate negative reward if a macro is just placed and overlapping with existing? Oh yeah, we, we tried that too. So, uh, um, you know, we give uh, negative partial reward uh, when we have overlaps. Um, the problem is um, the convergence speed was not satisfactory with that approach. Uh, it, you know, the RL was not learning enough to um, place macros, um, you know, not overlapping. So uh, we had to um, take this approach, you know, not allowing macros overlapping each other uh, to enforce RL to stay away from, you know, overlapping macros. Um, so, so that was um, the decision we, we made a, a while ago. Maybe we need to revisit this idea. Uh, it actually, um, um, I'll, I'll be covering in the later slide, but uh, we are now uh, struggling with the uh, high density designs, you know, we, where we have a lot of macros packed each other, you know, packed, um, and there isn't much of uh, wiggle room to place macros. In that case, uh, we are struggling to place all the macros and still, um, you know, uh, achieve high quality. Um, so we are now exploring how to, you know, allow partial overlap and then um, discourage it as, as we train more. And um, yeah, so that's our uh, work in progress. Great, thank you so much. All right, let me move on. So here's our early result. It's been like two years. Um, so uh, this, this was, uh, yeah. Um, yeah, so this was uh, the first successful, um, you know, result coming out of this project um, for the real design case, um, our uh, TPU block. Um, please understand that due to the confidentiality, uh, I had to blur the screenshot images. Um, um, so uh, on the left, I have human macro placement. Uh, you can Imagine the white areas are the macros, and the green is the standard cells, and the dark blue or you know the black is the you know empty areas. And a human expert, uh, you know, a physical designer, took about six to eight weeks to iterate multiple times and converge to this macro placement. And of course, uh, the six to eight weeks include the RTL development, co-development. Co On the right, uh, which is our earlier um, RL version, it took about 24 hours to generate the superhuman macro placement with uh, about 3% shorter while lengths. And um, this results um, in the, I mean, in the later part of my presentation, um, now it takes about six hours or less to generate macro placements because we made a lot of improvements to both the computational e efficiency and the learning algorithm. Um, physical designer commented that the half circular macro placement surrounding the standard cell cloud in the middle minimizes the violence between the standard cells and the macros. So this was obvious, um, obviously better. Um, and there were, wasn't much of a um, delta in terms of routability. So uh, this was a clear um, improvement result. So there's a question. Yes. Yes, and it's how, and this is from an anom anonymous attendee. Question is, how long would an expert take without co-RTL development? Um, if it weren't, um, yeah, so if without the RTL development, uh, it, only for the pure macro placement, 
this design was pretty big. Uh, I mean, this block was uh, more than 2 million, about 2 million instance. And uh, if we were to go through, um, like, for example, like five or 10 macro placement trials, it has to include the placement and then uh, QR evaluation. So I would say it takes at least uh, about two weeks um, to evaluate and then update macro placement. Um, and it's, uh, it can be partially uh, paralyzed or you can, you can uh, you know, come up with a strategy to you know, fully paralyze all the uh, you know, possible um, macro placements and then maybe reduce the time to a week, maybe. Um, but it's still um, you know, longer than um, you know, 24 hours, maybe, yeah. Thank you. Okay, uh, let me move on. Yeah, so, uh, so we, we saw the sign that uh, this RL method may work, but at that point, uh, it wasn't doing any, um, you know, learning transfer or, you know, it was trained only for a given pro problem, but uh, for the, the other case of our problem, you have to start from scratch and then train again, the, and, and it takes 24 hours again, right? So it's not efficient. So, um, the next step that we took was um, uh, we thought about how can we train policies that generalize across this problem. Um, so on the left, um, you know, the previous case, we were optimizing for a specific place placement of a netlist onto a flow pan canvas. And a training of policy to do this was an instance of the problem. But after seeing initial proof of in a concept, uh, we extended that to uh, the pictures on the right. Um, so, um, um, so you train for a multiple net list cases. And you go through a lot of iterations, and then at the inference, you are given a new net list, and you need only a few hundreds of iterations, which is pretty quick. Or you you can uh, if ideal um, you don't need uh, you know training at all. It just uh, do z zero shot uh, what we call zero shot to um, come up with a macro placement in uh, a second. So uh, if this works, then uh, this is gonna be great, and uh, we haven't achieved it yet, uh, but we are uh, working towards it. Yeah, so uh, we tried uh, several ideas to um, make generalization work. The first attempt uh, was uh, we took our previous RL policy architecture, we trained it on a bunch of netlists, and then we tried it on an unseen netlist. It just didn't work. Then we tried various other schemes like freezing different layers and testing on a new net netlist, and then that didn't work either. Um, so what we did in the end was to use a you know good old supervised learning to discover the architecture that would allow us to generalize across netlist. Yeah, the insight that we had was it was the value network that was not generalizing. The value network trained on placements gener uh, generated by a policy was unable to accurately predict the quality of the placements generated by another policy. So that was causing our policy to be unable to generalize to placing new, Mac, new netlist. So we decided to decompose the problem and extract a subproblem of uh, training policy that could accurately predict reward from off policy data. So we believe that if you are unable to predict reward across a very a variety of placements, then we would be uh, unable to solve this general problem of placing that list. So uh, in order to train a supervised model to perform this task, we compiled a large data set of 10,000 placements generated by uh, vanilla RL policies at different stages of maturity in the training process. This is valuable because it provides a variety of quality of placements. 
in the graph, different color represent the data for different levels. We have five different uh, samples, I mean, the different cases of uh, that list, and we generated a lot of data. Then we use this data set to find the right architecture that would be able to perform the task of predicting the quality of the placement. And this is the model architecture that we converged after much effort. We take input features such as node feature, x, y coordinates, uh, width and height of macro, and the type, and the features of the graph like macros, standard cells, and clusters. And we pass them to a custom graph convolutional network. I'll talk about it a little bit later. We also pass in that list metadata like total number of wires and macros. And we concatenate these and pass that into two fully connected models that will predict wire length and congestion. So this was used in uh, the supervised learning. Now let's take a look at the graph convolutional architecture. What we found was uh, other graph ne neural network approaches are more focused on uh, features of nodes, whereas in our problem, it's a more of a function of uh, edges. That's uh, if you want to predict wire lengths, it's not really about the, uh, the node features themselves. So we took the edge-based approach. We feed the features of the node like x, y coordinates, width and height into a fully connected network that produces an embedding to that node. And then we concatenate the embeddings and then uh, create the uh, edge um, embedding. And we add uh, the edge weight at the top. And then we pass that into another fully connected layer to generate an embedding, edge embedding. Then we present, then we represent the features of the nodes as average of, uh, of their edge uh, embeddings. So that, and then we, that seems like, yes? I'm sorry. Yeah, that seems like a, a, a fundamental rethinking of the problem. Am I right about that or? Yeah, so uh, this is, uh, yeah, this is uh, our novel approach. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, creating the edge embedding from the um, node embedding. Um, mm -hmm. And this, uh, we, I mean, we tried, um, you know, node-based graph neural network first, but it wasn't working. It wasn't capturing, um, you know, the netlist, uh, essence of the netlist. So it wasn't generalizing for, uh, you know, in the supervised learning. And um, then uh, we found that, you know, uh, if you think about the wire lengths, it's not about the edge, I mean, the node, it's more about the, the edge, right? So uh, that's right. why we, yeah, we uh, started thinking about how we can, you know, transfer, um, transfer the node into the edge. And uh, this is what we came up with. Yeah, because I was thinking about, you know, my background is in static timing analysis uh, in terms of technical expertise. And, you know, that's a, basically a node edge graph type of representation as well. And, uh, you know, it's been a little bit since, you know, I'm not totally familiar with the latest technology characteristics of like three or five nanometer process technology. But, you know, as you, as you well know, interconnect delay is always a challenge. And so I'm just wondering if a rethink of, uh, the graph representation for static timing analysis and then, then subsequently for interconnect optimization, if these thoughts would have potential value there too, or maybe you're already looking at this, I don't know, but I'm just thinking out loud here. Yeah, so uh, what we are hoping is, uh, you know, this these uh, edge um, embeddings will capture those, um, you know, um, um, those um, characteristics of the netlist in the, um, as we training, um, as we train the, uh, you know, problem case. So, um, you know, if we were to add uh, the timing aspect into it, the timing will be embedded into, um, you know, these uh, edge embeddings. And then uh, we'll be able to see how uh, it predicts the delay through the edges. Okay, thank you. It's great. All right. 
Okay, so uh, let me move on. Yeah, so, and then uh, we distribute the edge embedding to the node embedding, and then we repeat until we converge. At the end, we get the representation of the entire graph by taking the mean of the edge embeddings. And that's uh, that, uh, you know, uh, orange is uh, embedding um, in the middle. And then um, we combine other things and then uh, go through the fully connected layers to uh, get the violence and congestion prediction. And that's how we did the supervised learning. So this is the, uh, the prediction versus, um, you know, the actual uh, kind of um, graph. So you can see on the left violence, uh, we have a better correlation. Congestion is only a bit hard to predict. Uh, it's because it's kind of noisier metric, but you can see, um, you know, positive correlation there. Uh, this was done like uh, more than a year ago. So maybe we, now we have better uh, correlation, but yeah, anyhow. So uh, this is the entire picture of our uh, policy and uh, value model architecture. So on the left, you can see uh, the graph embedding and the you know, fully connected layers. And after that, we have um, the policy network on the top and the value network, uh, which is simpler on the, um, in the middle. And uh, we have a masking layer um, at the bottom, which masks uh, invalid moves. For example, when we place, we, when we have pre-placed macros or you know previously placed macros, we cannot place macro there, so we mask them off. Um, so that's added at the end of the uh, you know um, neural network. Um, here's our experimental setup. For pre-training, we used uh, one worker per block in the training data set. And the pre-training was done for 48 hours. For fine-tuning, we used 16 workers for up to six hours with early stopping. And for zero shot, we could generate the placement in a second, in less, less than a second using a single GPU. Um, so this is a, a visual comparison of uh, convergence speed of the training. On the left is a policy that was tra trained from scratch. On the right is a pre-trained policy that's being fine-tuned on a um, given that list. Uh, this is uh, Ariane Core, uh, open source uh, RISC-V. Um, each of these colored squares is a macro. And you can see that the policy on the left starts out quite random and it's going to take a while for it to reach a reasonable placement. Whereas uh, policy on the right, it starts from beginning uh, being very close to the optimal placement. And it shows the empty middle region for the standout cells so that it can minimize the violence uh, while maintaining acceptable congestion and density. And here are the convergence curves. The X axis is the training time and the Y axis is the placement cost. You can see that if you have a pre-trained policy that you're fine tuning, it almost, uh, almost from the very beginning, it's able to achieve the quality that is comparable to what the, the policy trained from scratch gets after about 24 hours. Yeah. So the pre-trained model helps, helps us gener generate high quality placements much faster. This had a question yeah. on the uh overall design topology of the TPU. And I apologize for my ignorance here on the actual topology, but is it primarily a standard cell-based design or is it broken down into some areas of uh, what I'll call structured custom? And also how much analog would be present on a given TPU chip? Uh, I mean, uh, on the ch TPU chip, we have some analog components, but uh, those are, you know, specialized components, and it's uh, outside our interest. Um, okay. We do. I mean, we do it manually. I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I cannot talk too much about detail uh, on that side. And That's um, fine. yeah. And the the TPU in general, it's a um, you know, a mixture of uh, uh, various uh, kinds of design. Uh, some some part it's uh, more arithmetic intensive and in some parts it's more of a you know wire dominated or you know data movements and um you know uh, mostly we do uh, we stay with the uh, you know the 
place and uh, automatic place and uh, we we try not to do too much of a um, you know a structured uh, you know uh, semi custom um, methods because uh, mere interest of uh, schedule um, but uh, um, yeah okay thank you yeah all right uh, not only not only do we get results faster but we actually show that a pre-trained policy that's fine-tuned that has better quality than what a policy trained from scratch converts to after more than 24 hours um, so the light blue bars are zero shot that generates reasonably reasonable quality medical placements in sub-seconds. And as we get to a darker blue, we do two to 12 hours of fine tuning of the pre-trained policy. Whereas the yellow is the policy that's trained from scratch. So fine tuning the pre-trained model produces better placements in less, ti less time than the policy trained from scratch. Uh, what's interesting to, uh, to us was the effect of the size of the training set that we pre-train our policy. Um, we actually don't even have that much data. We didn't have that much of data. So um, what we could do uh, if we were able to generate or augment our training set, um, so we did that. Um, on the left, the green bars are the small training set, only two blocks. The blue is five blocks, and the yellow is a large data set of 20 blocks. And um, the x-axis is how many hours of fine tuning we perform on the top of on, on top of the uh, pre-trained policy. The leftmost bars are zero shot. And we, as we go all the way up to 40 hours fine tuning, you can see the effect of the size of the training training set. So we are very excited about um, various approaches to uh, increase the size of our training set. And on the right, you can see the convergence curves for policies that were pre-trained with different amount of data. And you can see the smaller data set causes us to overfit more quickly to the at least the policy observed. So I'm uh, going to ask more. you, sorry. Yes. Yeah, so you're using a neural network as, as for the uh, implementation of this. Is that correct? Uh, implementation what? Oh, no, I just, so you have all this training data. Are you training a neural network? Is that what you're doing? Yes. So how, I'm just curious, how, how deep is the network and how, how wide is it? How, how many nodes, if you can say? Um, so uh, I think we have some numbers here. Uh, yeah, so you can see, um, yeah, we, how many layers and how, how large is our um, I apologize. convolution. Yeah, yeah. OK, thank you. All right. Sorry about that. No problem. So uh, what's also interesting was um, during the deployment uh, uh, to the product, our product, we found that the users were inspired by our MM placer. Uh, what I mean is on, on the left is how the human designer placed macros earlier. You know, uh, as usual, we, we like to place them on the periphery or, you know, in, in a row and column kind of a rectangular form, form you know, formation. But uh, when then uh, our ML placer placed macros quite differently, uh, you can see in the middle, um, but it was reducing wildlings and um, improving timing. So the user took the macro placement from ML placer and then rearranged a bit to further improve uh, worst negative select here. And uh, this was done uh, like more than a year ago. So this is our previous version RL. Um, so it, it had some problem with the timing, um, but anyhow, a user uh, got the hint from the ML placer and then uh, came up with a totally different manual macro placement that's inspired by our ML placer. So uh, here's a comparison of uh, our method against the state-of-the-art method replace as, a, as well as a human expert 
manual macro placement. For uh, uh, five TPU v4 blocks, we compared um, major quality metrics such as WNS, TNS, area, power, violence, and congestion. The results are from EDA tool after place opt step. Note that uh, our method optimizes wire lengths under congestion and density constraints. Uh, and we grade out the placements that are not usable according to our user. Uh, we reviewed the results and then uh, some were not looking good. So um, uh, we discarded uh, those. And you can see that in many cases, replace uh, fails to produce acceptable micro placements. Um, and uh, uh, to us, what's also exciting was uh, our placer also out outperformed human placements in most cases, uh, which was, uh, you know, human micro placement was a very strong baseline. Um, so uh, we were very excited to see this. Uh, this was done more than a year ago. Uh, we also compared our ML placer with the commercially available auto macro placers. Um, we tried two EDA vendor tools, uh, which had uh, several different, different modes and placer engines. And the table on the right shows the characteristics of blocks using the comparison in terms of uh, canvas saturation and macro counts. So we tried uh, uh, many uh, different real design cases in the TPUs. The top table shows the comparison um, uh, with the EDA tool A, B, and uh, manual macro placements. And uh, our ML placer is superior in, in majority cases. Uh, note that uh, users, physical designers, uh, review the data and comparing um, major metrics such as timing, congestion, and area. And if the quality of the metrics are similar enough uh, within noise level, we consider them as equal. And the bottom table shows that our ML placer showed uh, most number of uh, best cases among the competitors. And here uh, we have a comparison of the four methods for the TPUV5 block. Um, again, all the numbers are from EDA tool after place up step. You, we, you can see that the macro placements look quite different for each method. Uh, and the bottom table shows that our ML placer produced the best overall quality in terms of timing, area, and wire lengths. And you can see. Yes. No, sorry. We, I would, we, had, we did have a question. I don't know if we can, you can finish this, your thought here or however you want to. Yeah, yeah. Please go ahead. Okay. Yeah. This is from uh, Professor Matt Guthaus at the, uh, oh, never mind. He, he was just asking about the runtime, which you're showing that. So go ahead. I apologize. Okay. Yeah. So uh, EDA tool runtime, uh, there is some variation. Uh, and, and especially if the tool struggles in, in terms of timing, then the EDA tool runtime may increase. Right, um, so uh, you can see the TNS, uh, our ML placer uh, is, uh, you know, among the best, uh, you know, similar to manual case. Any other question? Uh, no, not at this time. Okay, so yeah, we are almost done. So uh, now uh, let me summarize this talk. Um, we, uh, we presented our deep reinforcement learning based ML, uh, in, you know, macro placer that learns to generate superhuman macro placements in several hours. Uh, which, and then we are trying to reduce the runtime by improving uh, our RL methods. And our method outperformed uh, academic state-of-the-art placer as well as commercial auto macro placers. And we used our ML placer in uh, our next generation TPU designs. Uh, two generations now. And uh, user feedback was positive in general. Of course, this is not perfect, but uh, um, you know, overall, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the feedback was positive. Uh, they learned from what ML placer does. And then actually, as in some cases, we used uh, the ML placer result as is uh, in the production.
um, we were able to accelerate uh, chip design process as a result. Okay, so that concludes my talk. Any more questions? No, that was a great talk. Uh, I truly uh, enjoyed the information. Are there any other questions from the audience? Doesn't look like we have any more questions at this time. All right. Thank you. So if not, then uh, you know, I appreciate uh, the excellent chat or talk and uh, also answering questions while we're on the fly. Oh, we do have a question. Here we go. Sorry. Uh, the question is from Akshay Kolkarni. How many years have you guys been working on this? Um, oh. It's been uh, three and a half years, I think. Yeah, uh, I joined uh, later, uh, you know, when I joined Google, uh, the project has been going for like a year or more. And that was uh, 2019. I'm just, I don't, I don't know if you can say, but I'm just curious, how many people do you have working on this? Uh, that I may not be able to come. Oh, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. I yeah. will. I apologize for the difficult question. All right. Anyway, I think it. I think it's exciting work and uh, very innovative. And uh, you know, I, I look forward to uh, you know you or Google being able to share further details on this and other developments as time progresses. So thank you. Yeah, one thing I want to mention is uh, we are looking into open sourcing this. Uh, so uh, you know, more um, you know, um, maybe from uh, academy or industry can uh, you know participate in this. Uh, you know. Um, uh, you know, advancing this uh, technology. So uh, uh, we are actively looking into this. Uh, maybe you will hear more uh, from us uh, in the future. Yeah, that would be great. I think there's a very interested community out there. And if there's anything I can do in terms of my role at Chips Alliance in ter terms of helping the dialogue on that, I would be happy to, uh, to do that. So that, I think that, that would be very uh, interesting for the community. All right. So, any other final questions? Oops, we did just got one in. Let me just get it for you here. Hang on. Oh, it's in chat. Sorry, that's why. If open source, if open sourcing, you might look into collaborating with eFabulous and the Skywater PDK. That yes. yes, that's a very good point. Go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, so we uh, we are aware of the uh, Skywater PDK and the EPAP list, and um, so uh, you know uh, we looked into uh, you know open sourcing uh, our RL uh, with uh, some sample designs that's open source in the you know the the Skywater PDK library. Um, you know we have that uh, program going on, um, so we might be looking into that as well. Uh, so currently we are. Um, thinking about, um, you know, open sourcing with uh, sample designs from uh, existing uh, open source benchmark circuits. Uh, but, um, you know, to be more realistic and then uh, staying, um, you know, with the EDA tools, uh, we may want to um, use the real library uh, to get the timing and, the, um, you know, more accurate metrics. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, so in general, I'll just comment from the Chips Alliance side, you know, one of the things that we definitely are uh, socializing or pushing in the, in the industry is the notion of open source tooling and PDKs and work closely with eFabulous and Skywater that are part of Chips, as is Google. So, you know, I am excited about the different possibilities here and, uh, you know, also working with, uh, with Matt of uh, UC Santa Cruz on Open RAM and then also with uh, Professor Andrew Kong and Tom Spiro of Open Road uh, UCSD efforts as well. So there's a lot of exciting activity in the uh, physical implementation and physical analysis space that we're trying to do, as well as in design verification, which is the other very important part of the overall uh, EDA ecosystem and designing chips. Any other final questions? Well, with that, uh, Wenjun, I want to thank you again. Youngjun, thank you for mm -hmm. the excellent presentation. And uh, 
you know, look forward to further dialogue on this topic. So uh, thank you again. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye.